Welcome to C3 San Diego. Need something fresh, real, and powerful in your life? Connect with us on social media, get live stream service notifications, podcasts, and up-to-date information on upcoming events. We are so glad you're joining us for a powerful, life-transforming message from one of our C3 San Diego pastors. We would love to hear about how God is impacting your life through this ministry. Please share your experience with us at info at c3sandiego.com. If you'd like to be a part of what C3 Church is doing in the city of San Diego and beyond, you can contribute financially by going to c3give.com and choosing the giving option that works best for you. We hope you enjoy this message. Man, you guys, you guys are just so much fun. It's just like, you make it so easy to be a ministry, this church does. It's, if, you, if you're pumped up about ministry, you'll be more pumped up. If you're tired of ministry, you'll get fired up. It doesn't matter what condition you're in. When you leave this place, you're going to be something totally different. So I just think, I, I, this is such an amazing opportunity to come here and uh, to take that freeway from Los Angeles and just, this is a place of refuge for me. I always said, that this really is, this is a place of refuge and I'm not talking about the city that I love, but I'm talking about the people in this church that I love as well. So I'm so honored to be with you guys, and thank you. And uh, your, I tell you, your pastor is just, without a doubt, one of the dearest friends that I have in all the world. I, I'll never forget one day we were playing a golf tournament together, and my brother, he's the real golfer. He's the champion. I'm the, I'm the son that just never figured it out. You know, I'm just, my whole family's played golf, and uh, I hit it where they don't mow the grass and all that places. And so I was playing so bad. Your pastor was just motivating me. I hit it 30 yards in the woods. He'd be like, that's okay, mate. That's okay. He goes, you'll find a way to get out of the woods. I never did, but uh, he always made me feel like I would find a way out. But uh, I love you guys. This is a great church, and I appreciate you so much for being friends to us all these years. And uh, I just, it's, it's amazing to have great friends. And we always thought when we came to L.A. that there'd be a church in the San Diego area, Orange County, somewhere in that area, that would just kind of love on us and encourage us. And you guys have been that church. And I thank you so much for everything you do. Amen. What a joy it is to be here. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to preach long tonight. And everybody who believes the preacher when he says that, say Amen. Yeah, there's like no faith in this room. It's like, show me, faith without works is dead, but I'll try. But tonight, uh, tonight I have a message I'm going to deliver that probably only has maybe a year of shelf life to it. But I figured while it's time, I, I want to share the, uh, my heart with you because I feel like this is a very athletic church and uh, this is a church that uh, it, 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 the fact that you're trying to lose your six pack means you had one at some point. So that's a pretty good thing, all right? So, uh, but tonight I'm going to speak on the subject of, I, I just got back doing something, oh, about five months ago, I just got back from the World Marathon Challenge. And if you haven't heard about the World Marathon Challenge, my one advice to you is don't do it, don't ever try, don't even think about it. But I just got back from running seven marathons on seven continents in seven days. That's 720... This might be my only chance I can impress some Navy SEALs or military people. Seven mar only chance. Seven marathons on seven continents in seven days. That's 168 hours. So just to give you a little background, um, it, it kind of it captured, it was all over the country, it became kind of a phenomenon when people heard that this crazy guy was going to attempt to run these marathons. So take a look at the Today Show talking about the World Marathon Challenge. Yeah. And, then, and then today is also, you know, I wrote that musical about Amy Semple McPherson sure. who started uh, Angelus Temple. Well, the pastor of Angelus Temple now uh, it has started something called the Dream Center, which takes yep. care of people in Los Angeles, the, the most difficult situations, people um, just mm -hmm. fighting everything. Well, he is going to be part of the, um, the seven marathons in seven days on seven continents starting today to raise money for them. They start in Antarctica. Listen to this. Then they wait, go to wait. And, he and runs they, a marathon in each place. Yes. So, then to South America, then North America, then Europe, then Africa, Asia, and Australia <gasps> to raise money for the Dream Center that feeds, fills the needs of over forty thousand people. Twenty-six and, miles a day. Each. And when do you? When does your body heal up from when you, it? When you're on the plane going to the next continent. I know it. <gasps> I, uh, so keep the him wow. in mind and everybody else that is running this thing literally for some. Some uh, amazing, I'm sure the people that they're running for are amazing organizations. That's so you can go on, I think it's called the World Marathon Challenge. I think it's called that. Anyway, that so is, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, all right. <laughs> 
So with that, my, my scripture is very, very simple, but very, very powerful tonight. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I do not count myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize to which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Lord, bless this word, and I thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. In uh, 2013, I was playing in a church softball game, and I was uh, trying to run to first base after getting a base hit. And so I was trotting to first base like 60 feet, and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't breathe. I wasn't in good shape, and, uh, but I'm in better shape. I can shuffle to first base without feeling like I was going to die. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. I kept drinking water. I kept trying to catch my breath. I couldn't stop breathing. And then I went to the doctor's office after because I, I, nine hours later, I went and nine games later, I went to the doctor's office because we kept winning. So what do you do when you win in a softball tournament? You just keep playing. Even though you're dying, you just keep playing, you know. And so I went to the doctor's office and uh, he put me on the scan. He checked my lungs and he said, I cannot believe that you're alive. He said, the reason why you couldn't breathe is that you were dying of blood clots that were blocking both of your lungs. You have a pulmonary embolism that's similar to Chris Bosch in the NBA that took him out of his NBA career. And uh, he said, you should be dead. I said, well, I'm not. And he said, but you should. He was getting mad at me. Have you ever been to the doctor? And he got mad at you for being alive? And he was like, you should be dead. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, I mean, he's like rebuking me for surviving or something, you know? And, and so um, after I, his rebuke, he said, well, you're going to live, but it looks like you'll never run a marathon as long as you live. I'm like, well, who cares? Why would I want to do something like that anyways, you know? Those people that put those stickers on their car, 26.2, it's like, why? Why would you brag about running 26 miles? And so I never quite understood it. So I, I took his advice, and I was driving home, but something about that man and what he said made me mad. Yeah. Something about that drive. He said, you will never run a marathon as long as you live. And suddenly, I felt motivated for the first time to run my first marathon. And so I went home. And, but first of all, I had to get through all the shots. They had these shots that they would give you blood clots. They put a, a needle in your stomach every day. A doctor showed up, and they just put it in your stomach to get the swelling down and, and all that. And the whole time they put that needle in my stomach, I thought to myself, I'm going to run a marathon. Once I get this needle out of my stomach, and so when, when the shots were done, I could start walking a little bit and breathing. I got my headphones on, and I put the old Rocky IV soundtrack on, you know, when he went to Russia to fight. Uh, and so I got that on, and I started walking. And I said, I, I'm going to walk my first block. I walked around the neighborhood. And then for like three weeks, I just walked around the neighborhood. And then week four, I, I kicked it up a notch. I began to trot a lap around a track. And, uh, and then two laps before long a mile. And then about a year later, I ran my first marathon, the LA Marathon, like four hours and 50 minutes, something like that. But it was my first one. And I was so excited. I said, I'm done. And, and then the people in church would come up to me and say, Pastor, the fundraiser for the Dream Center, um, the LA Marathon, uh, you know, for our organization went so well when you run. Can you run it again? Have you ever committed to something a, a long time in advance thinking it would never come? But can I tell you, that day always comes every single time. And I said yes, because my church always gets me in weak moments when I think that, uh, and, I, and I said yes, and they all held me to the word, and so I had to run. So for three years, once a year, I'd run that marathon. But one day, I was, I was running down the, um, the, the, the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, and, uh, and I was just kind of running around, the, the, just kind of trotting a little bit and roll, rolling around, and this guy sends me a text message. I don't know if you know, but he's a man named Phil Libatori. He's a really good friend of the ministry here. Phil's a wild man. He's the kind of guy that will volunteer you for things he will never do himself, you know. <laughs> he text messaged me something that said, 777. I thought, wow, does he have inside information on something spiritual, you know? Is this a prophetic word? And so I opened up 777, didn't know what it meant, and then I opened up and I never should have because I began to read about these crazy people who are running seven marathons on seven continents in seven consecutive days. And I read that, I thought about it, and then I said, get thou behind me, Satan. I never want to see you again. And <laughs> And then, he, and then I, I said, huh, that's great for them. I, I'll never do that. And then I see the bubble. You know, like when you respond to somebody and you see the text bubble, which means there's a response and you're waiting for. Sometimes it's good news. Sometimes it's bad. And the bubble seems to take forever, you know. And, and then he pops it up and it says, 
if you do this, I will make the first donation to the Dream Center to help the 750 residents that live in our hospital that we take care of. He said, I will give you $100,000 if you do this. <laughs> Suddenly, I felt the Holy Ghost to my feet, you know, I'm just like. <laughs> and, uh, and so I said, I thought, well, I can't turn that kind of money down for the people I'm trying to help. And so I said, okay, I'll do it. Ten months in advance, thinking that would never come, but that day always comes. And, uh, and so I started training and running around the Rose Bowl. I got to like 90 miles, like 100 miles a week of running. It was like waking up at 5, and then by the time 9 o'clock in the office rolled around, been like 17-mile runs and all this. And I was 15 pounds skinnier during the World Marathon Challenge I am now. But uh, I'm in complete rebellion mode from anything, anything running right now in my life. But, uh, but I was running, just getting really into it and, uh, and, and so pumped up. And then ESPN came, and they heard about me running and they did biographies on all the 33 runners and so I started reading the biographies and they were like this person has run 120 marathons and uh, this person does marathons for vacations every week and uh, this person woke up and thought about a marathon decided to do one you know and and then they came to me and everyone had these impressive bios of all these marathons they're saying Matthew Barnett He's run four marathons his entire life. It is getting ready to run more in one week than he's ran his entire life. <laughs> and so ESPN labeled me the most least experienced runner of the entire World Marathon Challenge. So I'm just going out there reckless, man, just wild and crazy. And I decide to go. And, and then for fun, I text a good friend of mine by the name of Ryan Hall. Ryan Hall's the fastest American marathoner ever. He ran 204, the Boston Marathon. And he was in retirement. He gained 50 pounds of muscle. He was tired of being 130 pounds. So he just turned into Captain America. I mean, he was lifted and getting big. And I text him, and he texts me back, Ryan. He said, I'll run the marathon challenge with you. And so now Ryan decided to go with me, and we got on a plane, and he hasn't talked to me since. I think he's mad at me. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> we got on the plane, and, and we were heading to Antarctica. And when we got on that plane heading to Antarctica, I forgot that Antarctica was a continent. <laughs> like in school, I'm like, oh, my goodness, seven continents. Antarctica is one of those. So we got an old Russian plane, and we had to put all of our gear on because it was like negative 30 degrees and all that. So you had to get everything on. An old Russian plane that looked like the Matrix, you know, and inside, and just wires hanging in there, and just wire. And uh, so this is a plane that we got on right here. This cargo, and me and Ryan Hall were on there, and we were just smiling and taking pictures and on there. That's Ryan on the left, one of the fastest American runners ever, some random Canadian dude on the right. And uh, so we were on there. And before we landed, before they landed, they said, everyone's got to put all of your coats on, all of your gear on, because when you get off that plane, you're going to feel cold like you've never felt cold in your entire life. You have to gear up now because you're never going to feel like anything like this in your entire life. So we landed, we got off the glacier, and then when they opened the door, the guy said, I don't know, I can't believe this. He said, this is one of the warmer days that we've experienced in Antarctica. He said, it's actually uh, like zero degrees in Antarctica right now. This is a miracle how warm it is right now. They were stunned. And uh, so I got off, and I was all cocky, you know. I'm like, I was shedding my jacket. And uh, I'm like, this is a sign, Ryan, that the Lord is speaking to us, that we're not going to have any problems whatsoever. We're going to be blessed the whole trip. And, and so I went out, and I started doing practice runs. I'm running on there. And that's not, I took off that big red jacket. We're in a lighter jacket now. And, and I went to the start line. I'm doing like I'm dabbing on the starting line, taking pictures, and uh, I mean, I'm just like, I'm totally disrespecting the climate of Antarctica in arrogance. And the man said, don't disrespect Antarctica, because it can change on a dime. Just like that, it can change. And boy, did it ever. 24 hours straight. That's how I slept, 24 hours straight of sunlight and freezing cold winds that were whipping through there. And uh, that's me just trying to figure out a way to sleep. It was so miserable. And, uh, and then, but we had a chance to run when it was zero. But the people from the Czech Republic said, no, we, we want to stay here longer and experience Antarctica. I'm like, well, the weather is zero. Let's go right now. And the guys from the Czech Republic were not like us smart Californians. They were like, let's just hang out longer and enjoy Antarctica. Boy, we hung out longer. And by the time we had to start, it was negative 30 degrees in Antarctica with 50-mile-an-hour headwinds on a six-mile loop. All of us got frostbite. The first half was nice. It was uh, sunlight and no wind. And the second half of the loop 
was so cold that you couldn't even run in a straight line. I mean, people who run six minute miles were being knocked over to the side, and the walkers were walking just as fast as the runners because that's how much the wind was slowing everybody down. And we, 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 we thinned, we began to run that track, and I was so miserable, and I was so cold, and my, I couldn't feel my toes and all that. And then God just began to speak to me, and I'm, I learned seven lessons on these marathons from each content I want to share with you. And the first thing he taught me is progress isn't always about moving fast. It's about gaining ground. And I thought, I'm not going to break any records right now, but I'm going to gain some ground. And I started firing up because that first half was kind of a no wind, and I'd get fired up for the second half. I'd put my head against the wind, and I would run, and I would even adjust my playlist to songs that were preparing me to take ground against the wind. I had Bob Seger's Against the Wind. I've been running again. And um, I had everything that had to do with the wind, you know, and I was just running against the wind. And, and I realized that progress isn't always about moving fast. It's about gaining ground and even though it wasn't moving fast I was getting somewhere and we got to the end I finished and I couldn't believe the wind was just whipping upon us and uh, I got to the end and they put our first medal on Antarctica they said congratulations you have just completed a marathon on and on the continent of Antarctica and they put that medal around my neck and then the plane was landing um, as we were finishing the run the plane had to land we had to jump in the plane really quick before it froze on the runway and it got back up and so we went to eat real fast and as I was there and they were fixing our frostbite and our feet and our hands in Antarctica it was the most crazy experience they said okay now you got to eat and we got to get back on the plane because we're flying to the next place we're flying to South America and so we got on the plane, the reality is setting in that we're like finishing a marathon, we're eating, we're getting on the plane. And now we're flying to Chile, and uh, so we're, we're going to Antarctica, we get on the plane, and we get there, and now reality is setting in. After an eight-hour flight, we land in Chile, and we are getting ready to run marathon number two about 14 hours after Antarctica. And now, I have been told that if you try to run a long distance after one marathon, it's the most excruciating pain ever. And so we went out, and you're supposed to take a 30-day rest after a marathon, uh, about 26 days for, for each day of the miles that you run. But now, just a few hours later, we're running in Chile. So we all get up to the front line. We're lining up, and uh, I didn't know how I was going to feel. But to my surprise, in Chile, I felt better than I thought I was going to feel. As a matter of fact, you know, it took a while to loosen up, but by, by mile six, the weather was nice, 50 degrees, it was perfect, a little wind that was blowing, and the people in Chile went out to meet us, and they were so kind and cheering us on, and halfway through, I thought to myself, I got a chance to break my record on one of these seven marathons. I can do it. I can go for my PR in one of these records um, in, the, in the marathon. I said, I'm going to go for it in Chile. And I was going for it, but something in my mind said, and my goal was to, to set my record on one of these runs, but something in my mind said, hold back. You know, you got to hold back a little bit because you don't know what's going to happen later. And so I kind of cruised and I finished. But I realized that, in Mar looking back on the Marathon Challenge at number two, I realized that sometimes in life you got to seize the moment when it's there. I held back. I stopped. But the moment was there. I felt good. The, the body was feeling good. That was a, my moment in time where I, I, everything just felt right. And I think sometimes in life there are moments where we are being blessed and we are prospering and good things are happening and, and we're in a season of victory. But in our mind oftentimes there's a place that says, well, I might need to hold back a little bit from getting all that God has for me in this season because something bad might happen down the road. And so we don't seize the moment that's there. At the Dream Center, we, every time God blesses us, we start a new program. We open up our new home for homeless veterans. When we just had a little bit of wind to our back, we decided to use that momentum to help the homeless veterans in our city. Everything that's ever started happened when there's a window of opportunity that oftentimes you get. We have to learn how to seize a moment when it's there. And I held back. I never got the record because I didn't seize the opportunity that was there. And I want to tell you, there's many of us that can face adversity. We can gain ground when the wind is to our face, but we've also got to learn to run when the wind is to our back. We've got to learn to run and seize all that God has for us. I know people that will say, well, good things are happening in my life. Something bad's about to happen. Don't say that. You just keep running because God will give you seasons of blessing and you take as much ground as you can and learn to seize the moment. But I finished in South America and it was good. They put a medal around my neck and said, congratulations, you have just run your second marathon in Chile. And I was so excited.
nevertheless, I was kind of disappointed in myself, but I was still excited. And so we got on the plane, and they said, now we're flying to Miami. So we had to stop in Columbia, and uh, we picked up some illegal. No, I'm just teasing. And uh, we stopped at Columbia to help us with the races. And uh, we stopped there, and then we flew to Miami. And then in Miami is when the reality was starting to set in that this was going to be tough. We got to Miami, and uh, on the way there, our feet started to swell. I mean, my feet were starting to swell up in the plane. Um, we flew on a private. That's my foot right there. Yes, just gorgeous feet. I have no idea why there's a spoon there. I took a picture of my foot. That's how crazy I'm starting to get in my brain now. I'm taking pictures, and there's a random spoon on the ground right there. And, uh, and so my feet were swelling up, and people were, everyone slept with their feet up. The, the plane, if you notice, did not go all the way down. So the seats ended right here, so there was no full reclining. So to get blood flow, people were sleeping with their feet up. And we just made an agreement that we were all just going to deal with each other's feet. It just had to happen, you know. And so we flew to Miami, and we got there, and we were starting to get in really bad pain. And, and there's a man that, that always beat me from Europe in every race. And I said, one of these times, I want to beat him. And we got to Miami. And when we got to Miami, though, even though we were tired, reality was setting in. This is going to be the most difficult journey of our life. When we got to Miami, something awesome happened. We were in our home country, the Americans were. We were in the United States of America. And I learned, number three, that family and friends make us perform at a higher level. And I got there. I had my family there. I had our trainer. The guy who trained me was the guy that we helped get off of drugs 10 years ago. Now he's a top certified trainer. And he was there. And I had people from L.A. and people from my family in the 80-something degree weather of Miami running next to me the whole time in relays. And they were throwing water on me the whole race. I had an unfair, unfair advantage. And I learned that that's the way church ought to be. Church ought to be an unfair advantage. Unfair advantage in this world. When you come into the house of God, they ought to say, man, it's not fair. They go into the Word. They go to C3 church every single week. They got an unfair advantage. Well, you can have that advantage too, come into the house of God. Our families ought to be a home court advantage. When our children come home from a long day of school and the pressures, when they see our house or our car parked outside our house, they ought to look at that house and say, I've got the home court advantage. My family is a home court advantage. My parents are a refuge to me. My church is a refuge. And a great church and a great family and a great support system can allow us to perform at a level that is greater than what we can do. And my fastest marathon was number three in hot Miami, where I passed the Eastern Europe guy that with the short shorts, the David Hasselhoff shorts, who beat me in every single race. I finally got him for the first time in Miami because I had the friends to support a family and friends. You can always perform at a higher level, and you have people around you that believe in you. That's why you need to get around encouragers. That's why you need to get around people that will throw water on you when you get hot in the journey and believe in the vision. And in North America, then I was done, and then we got a steak right there on the pier, and it was the best steak I ever had in my life. It felt like the last meal before death, but it was great. And I got my North America medal, and they said, you have finished your third marathon, and I'm feeling good. And so now uh, we get on the plane. We're flying to Spain, but this is the shortest turnover now. We're about 13 to 14-hour turnover to get to Spain to run our next marathon. So now the reality is this. We fly, we land, we go through customs, we change in the bathroom, we drive to the site, and we run a marathon, repeat, that's the reality. So now we're changing in bathrooms at airports, and so now we're there, and there's me changing in the bathroom. Look how skinny I was back then, man. And uh, there's Ryan Hall to the right. That's another French Canadian to the left right there. That guy was unbelievable, man, another random guy. And uh, he was there, and I don't know what the dude at the back is doing, but he's, you know... <laughs> But uh, we, we, so we ran the marathon, and uh, so I'm trying to find my stuff. You see my feet down there just really swollen, and we get there, and then we go, to, we go to the starting line. And I'm looking at all these ultra marathon runners, people like Mike Wardian, one of the greatest ultra marathons in the world. He averaged 245 every single marathon. He did the Barclay Marathon, one of the greatest ultra runners in America. He became one of my dearest friends on the journey, but I'm looking at all these ultra guys, and they're like doing everything I didn't think they would do. I thought they'd be drinking like vegan water or like <laughs> coconuts from like Himalayans or something, you know? Uh, they were drinking like sodas and eating candy bars and sugar overloading the whole time, you know? And there's Ryan Hall, he's grabbing donuts. Doesn't it look like he's giving a bad gesture there? He's like, 
It looked like that's his opinion about the marathon. And it was, and, uh, and he, they're just eating donuts and sugar and, and just loading up on, on all this. And, and so I was running in Spain. I was feeling pretty good. But in Spain, it was, it was a weird route because we went up the hill and then down. Uh, it was just an incline and down the whole time. And as I was uh, partially through the way of Spain, my knee just went out in a way I've never felt before. My patella tendon just began to strain. You can feel like an accordion stretching, like something was about to happen. And uh, I frayed my patella tendon as I was running. And I stopped. And as I was going, I came to a screeching halt. And I raced to the checkpoint to say that it was over. I was telling everyone, I can't do this anymore. I explained what was going on. The doctor looked at it. We have eight hours to finish the marathons, or they basically kick us off the island, and we forever go into the hall of shame, never to be known again, you know. And, and so uh, they, they, they just um, they looked at it. He said, I don't think you can go on. I said, well, I'll do two more miles. And, and I just wept. And I just cried. I said, Lord, I'm going to disappoint all those people back at home. All those people in the recovery program who said, Pastor, if you finish this marathon, I'm going to finish the one-year recovery program at the Dream Center. All these homeless moms that live in our building that said, Pastor, if you finish this, I'm going to get my GED, and I'm not going to quit school, and I'm going to get my education. And they started flashing through my mind, and I just broke down. I said, but God, there's no way I can run. I couldn't even bend my knee, and I was just moving this way, and I just had the biggest probably fatigue and a lot of things going on. But one of the biggest breakdowns I've ever experienced, I just wept. And then after I began to weep, I began to realize, number four, point number four, something so powerful. Sometimes you need a good breakdown to get to a breakthrough. And I just allowed my heart to be broken. I cried until I could cry no more. And you know what happened at the end of my tears? I found a solution. You see, many times we don't allow ourselves to break because at the end of your breakdown, there is usually a solution at the end of your breakdown. You'll get to the breakthrough. And if you just allow yourself to say, God, just break me down to the core, yes, God will fill you. But sometimes you just need him to dry you up so that he can expose what's going on in your life so that he can fill you again. And I just wept and I wept. And then, and then I had a thought that came to my mind that only a breakdown can produce. In the middle of the tears and the weeping and the sorrow and telling God, God began to speak to me. He said, well, you probably can finish this marathon still. That's how God deals with me. God deals with me in parts. He strings me along my whole life in 23 years of pastoring. Well, you can finish this marathon. I said, okay, God, I'm going to finish this marathon. I went to the checkpoint. I told the guy, the uh, guy from the BBC that was there, like a chronicle. I go, I'm going one more lap. I'm going to finish this thing. And so I went out and, and I learned how to run by locking my leg and doing the Frankenstein trot, which is basically, this is what it was right here. And in training, they developed all the other muscles just in case something broke down. I might be able to carry myself by other muscles that I can use. And so I locked my left leg and I began to run like this and I got to the end of the Frankenstein trot, man. You talk, you talk about a gangster shuffle. I mean, this was a real gangster shuffle. This wasn't a fake one, you know. I mean, this wasn't, a, this wasn't a gangster shuffle of someone who writes rap and lives in Malibu. I mean, this is the real deal right here, you know. And, and I got to the end of it, and the guy put a medal around me in Europe, and he put it around my neck, and he's like, congratulations, you have finished. And I, I just cried. I said, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to finish these four. I'm done, but it was a, thank you for giving me perseverance. And, and my knee was in pain. And then they told us that we could take showers in this Italian restaurant bathroom. It was the coldest shower I've ever taken in my life. And I was, I was tired and angry. And they went to dinner there. And everyone's getting ready to load up to go to the fifth running site, which was Morocco and, uh, and, and, and Africa. And so I'm there. I'm hugging everybody. I'm saying goodbye. Everyone's heading to the bus. I'm getting ready to, just to find a way from, from Spain back to home. I'm, I'm calling. Like, the airport and then God just began to speak to me and he said why don't you just give me 24 more hours God's been playing that trick on me for 23 years do you know how many times I quit the ministry in LA when the ministry got too hard and I drove down the freeway and I saw that Dairy Queen on the 5 freeway you know in between um, LA and San Diego area and the Lord just said uh, you know if you want to quit first of all have a Dairy Queen blizzard and I eat that blizzard I'm like okay Lord I'll go back home again he's been playing that 24 hour game on me for years I said really God he said yes I said okay God I'll do it because I knew what God was saying to me God I've 
I thought God was saying to me, if you go out and run for the next 24 hours, I'm going to dramatically heal you. So I had these visions. I was going to get to Morocco, and it was going to be like Forrest Gump, you know, when he started running, and all the braces fell off his leg, you know, and... And I, got, I learned lesson number four, you got to have a breakdown to get to a breakthrough. So I got that. But then when I got there, I, in Morocco, I thought the fifth lesson is I'm just going to be healed. I'm going to run in obedience. And I gave God 24 hours. So I lined up in the start line. This is what I did. I said, I'm going to sprint as if I'm healed. And I know God can heal you. Trust me. He's done it so many times in my life. So I really believe that God, I mean, God can, he's done it many times. So I thought this was the way it was going to happen. So I said, one, two, three, and I start sprinting, and I just, my knee just buckled. I literally just collapsed to the ground, and I couldn't even move. And I'm like, my God, why have you forsaken me, Lord? And, <laughs> and I got up, and I was just, you know, back to the Frankenstein shuffle again. And, and I mean, people were passing me, and I, I, I was like in the top 10 out of 33 at one point, but now I'm fading in the standings. And I don't know why that's even on mine, but the competitor is always thinking that, you know. And I, I'm moving there. And then these soldiers were lining the area, these soldiers um, in Morocco, because there have been threats on some of the runners or different types of uh, terrorist things in the past that they, they're, they're dealing with. So they were all lining up and watching us run, protecting us and uh, some of these soldiers. And this guy, one guy was looking at me as I was trying to run the marathon like this. Like, man, we're never going to get home from this shift right here, you know. And uh, he's so mad. And so I'm running. And then I see these lampposts in Morocco. The whole course. I'm, have you ever had so much pain you can feel in the back of your head and you're just kind of like almost existing? But I look at these lampposts. And as I'm looking at these lampposts, I thought to myself, well, God, how about if I just run one lamppost and walk another? That's going to be my strategy. And number five, you know what I learned? I learned number five, don't even think about how far you've got to go. There are times in your life where you can't finish the course, but you can fight a good fight, and you can finish, uh, kept the faith, and then one day you'll be able to say that, that, that you've kept the faith. Fight the good fight, finish the course, and kept the faith. And I said, you know what, I can fight a good fight. And so those lampposts, I would run one and walk one. And there's Michael Wardian behind me, the greatest runner. I'm actually beating him right here. No, actually, he's lapping me for the sixth time, but... And he had come behind me and tapped me on the back and said, you can do it, man. And then there I was and trying to make it around in Morocco. And, uh, and I learned somehow in some crazy way. I finished that crazy marathon in six hours and 38 minutes, an hour and a half ahead of the deadline, even though my goal was to run under four, uh, four and under per lap. I finished at 638 because I realized that sometimes you can't even worry about how far you've got to go. There are times in your life where you just got to get that lamppost strategy and say, you know what? I might not be in a season of running, but I can walk a little bit. I can run a little bit, but I'm always going to move forward. I'm always going to move forward no matter what. And just because you're not moving as fast as you had before doesn't mean you're not succeeding. Sometimes you're succeeding more by enduring than you are when everything is going right. Success is sometimes shuffling. It's sometimes barely making it, sometimes just um, putting your chest forward and finding a way. And little by little adds up over time. People think the Dream Center is this overnight success. You know, it's taken us 23 years to finish that building, that 400,000 square foot building. But something happens when you don't worry about how far you've got to go. You just set some small goals on the way to the big goals. And Paul said, I fought a good fight. I have finished the course. And one day I'll be able to say I've kept the faith. There's times in our life where all we can do is just fight for the little bit of ground that we can gain. And that one lamppost and one off, and somehow I finished that. And I got to the finish line in Africa, and they put that medal around my neck. And I realized, you know what, I'm not going to worry about all the places I want to be. I'm just going to love the moment that I'm, at, that I'm at right now. And I'm going to enjoy where I'm at on the way to where I'm going. Don't even think about how far you've got to go. So we finished in, uh, in Morocco, and now we're um, heading to Dubai. And uh, we're flying out to Dubai. And I got to tell you, I'm sure Dubai is a wonderful place. I didn't see much of it. I'm sure it's a lovely place. I'm just taking random pictures in the bus, you know. I'm sure it's wonderful. But to me, Dubai was one of the personal hell spots in my life. I mean, not because of the country, but because of the condition that I was in. That's how I looked like in Dubai. That's it. That's what I had. That's like Forrest Gump. I mean, that's like uh, Tom Hanks and Castaway right there, you know. And that's like energy gel stuck to my chin. But I didn't care, you know. I'm just, I'm rocking it right there, you know. And, 
And so we, we get to Dubai, and uh, we get, didn't, by, by the time we got to Dubai, it was, it, was, it, it was an experience I will never forget. Phil Liebertor, the guy who gave $100,000, he showed up in Dubai to run with me. And so Phil met me there in Dubai, and there he is. The guy, that's the guy got me started, $100,000 to the left. Look at, we're all zombies at that point in Dubai. Look at Phil. He's like, you can do it, Pastor. He told me I'm with you to the very end, Pastor. You and I, I'm, I'm going to run my first marathon with you. There's Phil. There he is. 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 And... And there he goes. He's out, you know. And uh, well, I never saw him again, but uh, he said, oh, I'll send you a check, and he stopped. <laughs> and that's about as fast as that was the beginning of running in Dubai. And, and Dubai was really kind of the, the point where I, there's no way in the world I could ever go forward. I was thinking about that, and as I was kind of moving down there, um, I looked at my times, and halfway through, I wasn't going to make the splits. I wasn't going to make the eight hours. So this time, I got used to the pain to the point to where I, somehow I could work through it, but I wasn't going to make it according to time. And I was getting ready to tap out, and there's a man that had been following me on Twitter who lives in Dubai and London. And so he works two weeks in Dubai, two weeks in London, and he played uh, rugby in South Africa. And he was following my journey. And that morning, he woke up and he read the word of God that said, in love, serve one another. He read that scripture in Galatians. It touched his heart so much to where he said, I have been serving people, God, the way I should. He said, I remember that guy that's struggling on the marathons. I remember that guy, that Matthew Barnett guy. He showed up to the track and he said, where's Matthew Barnett? And they said, don't worry, just, he's just shuffling down the boardwalk and, uh, if you roll, you'll run into him. You know, there he is. And uh, you don't have to look very far. And he came alongside me. And uh, he said, how you doing? I said, oh, man, I'm just, I'm just struggling. And I, I'm not going to make my time. And so I don't think I'm going to make it. But, uh, and, and this guy showed up right here on the right. I've never met this guy. Look at me right now. I still think he's an angel. I really do. I think he's an angel. I, really, I, I talked to him on the phone still. And I call him an angel. He said, no, I'm a human being. I don't know. You are an angel. And he showed up, and he started stretching me and different things like that. But then he would stop, and uh, he talked about playing rugby and, and all that. And I was, I was ministering to him a little bit, just talking. But then I just said, you know what, I'm done. And they said, oh, yeah, but before you leave this track, he said, could you give me some advice about men's ministry? Now, there's nothing worse in the world than when you're in the worst pain in your life, somebody wants to talk to you about how to start a men's ministry in your church. I'm like, all the men can go to the booger man for all I care right now. You know, who cares about men's ministry? Who cares about those men who need the Lord? I'm dying, you know. And, and, then, and, then I, like, and then he started asking me all these ministry questions for like 45 minutes about. And what happened was I stopped thinking about how much pain I was at. He did that on purpose. That sneaky guy showed up and he did whatever he could. And before long, I'm like, oh, I'm at mile 18. And he's like, you know, I think you got a chance. He goes, if we stretch after every lap, and I put, I think you can make it. And so I got to the end, and I looked at the clock. I'm like, I have a chance. That's why you got to keep going, because one day you'll wake up and realize you do have a chance. There is an opportunity. You will get to the end of the clouds. And it looked impossible, just like your circumstances look impossible, but you can get through. And I looked, and I said, I might be able to get under eight hours. And so I'm just like, you know, this. And like, I mean, I'm like, I'm like moonwalking, whatever I can do. I took my shoes off, but somebody stole my shoes because my shoes were digging in my Achilles. And now I'm, I'm doing barefoot. And somebody took my shoes in Dubai. I mean, who, who would do that, you know? And I got to the finish line. Everyone was already in the, um, in the hotels showering because Everything under eight hours, you bank that time. So you have free time. If you finish in four and a half hours, um, you get three and a half hours now to hang out or whatever. Michael Wardian finished in 2.45. So, I mean, he's like showering, going to spa, getting massages, rubber ducky in the bathtub, the whole thing, you know. And, and Michael, uh, Michael, and I got to the end, I'm like, I didn't know where I was. I was completely delirious. The heat, the fatigue, I'm sitting in the back of the bus. And I just literally just felt like I wanted to die. And I looked around. I don't have my shoes on. The guy's like, you don't have time to take a shower. You're going to have to fly 16 hours now, stop in Indonesia, then to Australia. But because of the time and the scheduling and the rules, you got to just go. And so I'm sitting there in the bus seven and a half hours, and uh, I'm just miserable. I mean, I'm just I'm thinking about you know, paper towels in the, in the airport and just wipe my butt. I'm just, I'm just so angry. And then Michael Wardian comes by, and he says, hey, I got some, some, some slippers from the spa when I was enjoying my 
massage that you can have. I'm like, that was like the nicest, meanest thing you could ever say in the same sentence, you know. And he gave me these little cheap uh, spa slippers, you know, that he banked that much time. I think people loved me because I was giving them more time, you know. And I put the shoes on, and we got on the plane. I'm sitting there on the way to Australia. But what I learned, um, not only number five, I learned don't think about how far you've got to go. I learned number six that God will send you angels of mercy along the way if you just keep going. There are people that God's going to send your way. There are angels of mercy God has set up for those who refuse to quit. As I put the metal around my neck, I realized that God was sending angels everywhere. There comes a time where you can't do what you try to do on your own. God said, enough is enough. I'm going to send people that are going to help you get to where you need to go. I'm going to send you a church that's going to give you a word when you need it the most. That's going to help you. I will send one form of an angel along the way. I'm wearing six medals right now, man. I'm walking, and, and, and I'm feeling like a little bit of momentum, feeling awful. I finally get on the plane. I slept 10 hours in seven days. 10 hours in seven days. So now I'm going to Australia. It's the end of the flight. I'm tired. I, I, I couldn't shower. I don't have any shoes on. They're in the bottom of the plane. I got to figure out a way to get them. And there I am sleeping, and I finally fall asleep for the first two hours. And after two hours of sleeping, my body, I, I was woken up by something I could never possibly imagine. I've heard people talk about, never experienced anything like it. But because of the heat and the pain and, and, all, and the dehydration, everything I'm going to, my body woke up in a panic attack. I didn't, know, I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a blood clots because I almost died of blood clots. I thought I was having, and that probably increased the panic. I thought I was dying of the pulmonary embolism. I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was walking around. I was stumbling, and one of the guys from England sat me down, and he said, hey, you know, he was attending to me, and, and, and I just sat there, and they put fluids, and I looked at the map. There was no landing place. We were over water, hours from land, hours, and I looked at that screen. I thought, Lord, I'm going to die. I really felt like I was going to die. I just sat there and I breathed. I turned on some movie that was in Italian. I didn't even know what I mean, but just to keep my mind off it, I'm watching this movie with subtitles in Italian, and I think, Lord, I'm going to die. I'm going to die watching a movie in subtitles. I don't even understand. What a way to go. I was watching, just, just trying to breathe, just trying to breathe for hours. And I land, and the ambulance comes, and they take me, and I, I don't, I, the customs, they basically do all that. I mean, they, they give, and I just go straight to the I, Manly Beach in Sydney, Australia. They take me to the hospital, and it was crazy. In the middle of the night, they rush me through there, and I get to this hospital, and nobody's there. I mean, not even one person is there. There I am right there. Another wonderful picture of myself sitting there. In Australia, the guy, the, the nicest man I've ever met meets me and the doctor, and, he, and, he, and he, he sits me down. Have you ever done something so stupid to get you in that position you didn't want to tell the doctor why you're there? He's like, why you're there? I'm like, well, I'm running seven marathons in seven days and seven contests. He's like, this is awesome. This Australian doctor was like so pumped up about it. He's like, we got to get you back on the track. We got to get you to finish this thing. I got to get fluids in your body. I got to test you. God bless the Aussies. God bless him. He goes, he goes, if you don't finish this, you're going to regret this for the rest of your life. My journey started with a doctor telling me I will never run a marathon. And now I got an Australian doctor saying, if I don't go on there, I'm basically a wimp and a coward. I'll regret it for the rest of my life. He does all these tests and everything. And like, I mean, tons of tests. And he says, you're good. You're good. You had a panic attack. We see it all the time with crazy people who do crazy events like this. It's stress induced. You're going to be fine. I don't even know if he did tests. He probably didn't do one test. He just told me I was okay. And he sent me out to the track and he said, go for it and finish this thing. And now, though, I had 12 hours to finish this one because we banked so much time in travel. Uh, in the 168 hour rule, I had 12 hours left. And so I got there two hours later than the other runners. And I started like 4 o'clock in the morning, and, and there was a man that showed up. It was crazy. He showed up um, from Hillsong Church in Sydney, the outreach director. He showed up, and he's like, what's going on, mate? And I had the worst accent. Sorry, I'm not like here again. I go, I'm just, he goes, I heard about your journey. He's like, I'm going to run the whole thing with you. I'm like, the whole thing? And I'm like, dude, you don't have to do this. This guy did not look like a runner at all. But he's one of those guys, like, you know, at the beginning of your church, people are like, Pastor, I'm with you to the end. And they have good intentions, but not necessarily true, you know. But, uh, but, he, but he's like, I, I'm like, if you want to quit, you can quit. And he, he kept going and kept going. And he ran his first marathon with me. He finished the whole thing. And I finished the seventh marathon. And I realized something so powerful. 
I realize in Australia, that's a wonderful place to finish, by the way, but um, do you know what I realize? That God can take you from the lowest of the lows to the highest of the highs just like that. I went from 14 hours ago thinking I was going to die, feeling like it was over, to 14 hours later realizing that my whole life had just entered into a brand new era. And that's what God can do in your life. He can take you from the lowest of the lows to the highest of the highs. I went from thinking I was going to die to one moment where God touched my life to feeling like I could do anything and feeling like I was going to on top of the world. And then when I got back, I got a call from ESPN. My, my dream had always been on ESPN to be on SportsCenter. But I've never been a good athlete, you know. I thought I'll never be on ESPN plays of the day. But I would watch that. And I would say, man, wouldn't it be great? And I finished the marathon. And, and uh, they came up. They gave me this medal. And they said, now you are a member of the Seven Continents Inter- Intercontinental Club. They put that medal. And they said, now you are a medal, uh, Marathon International Club. I've never heard of it. Now you're a member of the World Mayor. And so I have 10 medals instead of seven. I'm feeling like Flava Flav, you know. I'm like walking all the way. And then ESPN. I close with this. ESPN calls. And ESPN says, we want to honor you and the guy who got first place as ESPN top 10 plays of the day. Now, it's not very long. It's like a 10-second video. But this is my moment to shine. God will give you not only things that you want, but things that you didn't even know that you want. If you just keep going on, take a look at my ESPN plays of the day. All right, so we get this marathon challenge, seven marathons, seven days, seven continents. So Ma- this is Matthew Barnett, who is Ryan Garcia's buddy, tore his knee in four of the, uh, the marathons, didn't quit, finished all seven. Good on you. This cat right here, uh, Michael uh, Wardian, under three hours for the seven races. Now, who got featured on that? The guy who stumbled to the finish line and the guy who broke all the records. Which means there's always a way to win. There is always something that you can inspire people to do. You just got to keep on going and never quit. Because God can resurrect you from the lowest of the lows to the highest of the highs. Every head bowed, every eye closed all over this room tonight. All over this room, there are people here today that feel like quitting. You feel like giving up. You feel like throwing in the towel. But the great thing about God is if you throw in the towel, he'll always give you another one. It's not time to quit. It's time to surrender. It's time to say, Jesus, I feel like I'm in a place in my life where I'm at the lowest of the low. But today, I give you that low place in my life. And that's what salvation is about. Salvation is about coming to the end of ourself and really kind of thinking that life is over. There's nothing left. I have nothing. This world has given me nothing. I have nothing left only to give your life to Christ and suddenly realize that God can resurrect all of your pain, guilt, shame, burn bridges, sleepless nights because of our own mistakes, and then turn it around into something so beautiful. If you're here tonight and you'll say tonight is my night, I want God to resurrect me from the lows of my life to a brand new place. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to surrender my life. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor John in about 60 seconds, but you're here tonight, and and let him kind of lead it from here. But you're here, and you'll say, tonight is my night. I want to know Christ as my Lord and Savior. I've run away from God. I've been the lowest of the low. Or maybe I'm just at a place where I feel so lost, but today I want to surrender because we serve a God that literally takes people from from the pits of despair and transforms them into something they never thought they could be. All over this room here today, Take one more step. Take a step towards Christ and watch him move. When I say three, I want you to raise your hands all over this room. God's about to resurrect you. You came here tonight uh, hearing kind of a fun story, an inspirational story about a marathon, but it's your journey. We are all on a race, and it's only for those who just decide that they're going to keep on going. They're going to trust, but there does come a time in your life where you just have to come to the end of yourself and be carried by the one who can take you where you need to go. The place where you've always meant to be in his arms. One, all over this building. Two, I believe the Holy Spirit is moving. When I say three, I want you to raise your hands today. Who will say today, I want God to resurrect me from the place I am, the lows of the low. Take me to a new place, God, that only your love and your salvation can bring me. If that's you all over this room, I want you to raise your hands right now. Three, lift them up all over this room. Just lift them up. They're going up. Yes, 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 yes. Just keep boldly raising them. Here I am, God. Resurrect me from where I am. Take me to where you want me to go. Hands are going up everywhere. 
Everyone raising your hands, repeat these words after me. And everyone together, repeat these words. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross that I might be saved. I repent of my sin, and I give you my life. Thank you for dying for me. Now I live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. God, give us the courage never to quit. Thank you so much for joining us online. We hope you had a powerful experience. We want to take this time to personally help you navigate the next steps in becoming connected. If you made a decision for Christ today, need prayer, or want more information about our church, go to our website, c3sandiego.com. And if you didn't get a chance to give online during service and would like to contribute financially, you can go to c3give.com and click on the giving option that works best for you. We look forward to hearing from you. See you at church.